Hi, everybody. Jose Palomino with another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. And today's guest is Sue Nordman, CEO of Obsidian Manufacturing Industries. And Sue is leading a company that's an OEM of some critical uh, technologies that are used in modern day manufacturing. And what she's learned in the last two years about pivoting is what we need to listen to because there's been a lot of pivoting, a lot of necessary changes in strategy and approach and dealing with things as simple as finding, you know, the proverbial screw in the haystack so that you can actually make something. So we're going to talk to Sue right now. Listen closely as we get an owner's perspective on pivoting through difficult times. Welcome, Sue, to Business Growth on Purpose. Hey there. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. We, uh, our listeners know we like to bring on experts and we like to bring on owners who are in this industrial space, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you're both. So, uh, so you're a twofer. That's great. Yep. So, so, so just, just to clarify for our listeners, uh, what do you do and who do you do it for? We are Obsidian Manufacturing and we own four brands. Um, our Magdalene brand is Work Holding. Uh, we own Ardor Precision Grinders, which is rotary surface grinders that have been around over 100 years. And we also own two lift magnet uh, brands, Magna Lift and Power Grip. And we also do um, repair services of all of our products or competitor brands and um, surface grinding. We have four large surface grinders that we provide gr- uh, grinding services for. Okay, so, so we're busy. Yeah, I can imagine, <laughs> right? Things are busy now. The things are hopping in manufacturing in yeah. the US in the last year, year and a half, clearly. Correct. And uh, you know, in our pre-call, we touched on that a little bit, and and, and I, I do want to get into a broader theme about marketing, but just stuff that's happening now, and people uh, in manufacturing getting busy. Mm-hmm. But sometimes not really knowing why other than, hey, I'm happy to take the orders. And I always tell people, like, if you're getting orders, like, be happy, like, it's good. But it's also good to think a little bit about that it come about because you were thinking about you did something strategic, you did something right. different, or it's just your good fortune. So as you look out at the market, kind of what do you, do you see the backlog being caught up now? Or is it as busy as it's been the last year? Uh, we've been kind of like on a roller coaster ride. A lot of things to do with the economy um, uh, has our customers waiting sometimes. Uh, right now, I've seen a lot of customers request for quotes, um, especially for newer equipment like new electromagnetic chucks or um, uh, new lift magnets, and then they just kind of wait. Mm-hmm. So it's like they need to know the price. They need to know what to budget for, but they're not quite ready. They need some kind of sign. Um, usually when something good happens in the, in the economy, um, the, like the floodgates open. But we're diverse enough and well-rounded enough that um, when uh, people first start, when the economy first starts picking back up, we'll see a lot of grinding because people need to get their material ready for whatever they're going to make. Um, that type of thing. So it, you know, we've got ourselves spread out enough over a different, many industries. So um, we, we always see things coming and going, but there are gauges in the economy that always, I can see what's going to happen from this, that, or whatever happening. When right. um, the Russian Ukraine thing was first happening, there was surges. I mean, we just couldn't keep up. Our office people were so busy with quoting and new orders coming in and we've kind of got some time right now to catch up which is good so wow so it's interesting right so obviously you know no what's the uh the title of the book what no man's an island right it's no person yeah no no company you know we're not we don't exist in a vacuum we're exactly we're in such a connected economy so what's, what's interesting to me, though, is I know uh, for somebody in the, in the small to mid market, we, we don't often see people try to do much in the way of really sophisticated marketing or even like modern digital marketing with some mm-hmm. exceptions. And I think you're one of those exceptions. You, you're committed to it. Most was that definitely. something that, yeah, did that, did that come up 
slowly or was there like a moment in time where you said, no, we, we got to do this to be relevant in the, to the future? Um, ever since I've been involved in any of it, um, I've been pushing for marketing. You have to be out there. You have to, you have to let customers know what it's like, um, your culture and your company, um, how your business practices are and just the products that you make and how you service your customers. That's, it's just, you have to be transparent about those things. And marketing is a good way to do that. Good way to, uh, relay your messages to, to your, to the world. I mean, let's face it, everything's on the internet. So who knows who, who's looking at your stuff? Right. And yet to this day, and I'm sure you have perhaps colleagues or peers in the industry that you've heard say like, you know, our reputation precedes us. And we Correct. get a lot of our work through referral. And yes. when I hear that, I realize, okay, so you, you know, the, the person saying that I, I, I kind of sense they're a little bit intimidated by all the newfangled stuff, which by the way, isn't that newfangled anymore. It's yeah. like 20, we've been doing it 20 years. Yeah, so it's not, it's, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So how, you know, I guess for somebody who's kind of on the fence that they look, I get lots of orders from, my, let's say they're, they're servicing somebody, a big man, like they, they, they service Boeing or something like mm -hmm. that. And they, they're kind of happy with that. What would you say to them in terms of like needing to be, because you described some real advantages of marketing the way you described it, like letting people know about you. Mm -hmm. Would you say to that person that that world is going away completely and they better get with the new world or? Well, you know, some of those people are our customers and we've seen a major corporation pull in their orders, switch to someone else, contract someone else. And we've seen businesses go under because of that. Um, anybody that's too centralized to one or two companies and just has fill in work locally or something, um, you're putting yourself into a situation that when that company pulls the order, changes things, moves their headquarters, whatever it may be, restructure things, which I think a lot of that's going on in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a lot of big companies, um, you're putting yourself into a situation that you could end up not being able to get out of. Yeah. And sometimes it's a slow death where it's like we, they need another five, uh, another five points off of your margin. But mm -hmm. you do that enough years in a row and yeah. they'll keep coming back to it. And then at some point you think, well, we've, lo we've been loyal to you. We've served you so well for so long. Doesn't mm -hmm. that count for anything? Yeah. And then you realize you're talking to somebody who's been on the job for two years and they don't remember any of those things that start, you know, 20, because the business yeah. changes too fast. Exactly. And that person that they were dealing with retired, switched locations, departments. And unfortunately during COVID, there were some of our contacts that actually passed away. So, I mean, wow. once you lose that connection, it's very hard to get back into those big companies. I mean, we have like a customer list that's six, seven, 8,000 different contacts and, you have to be constantly updating them, reaching out to them, making connections because people come and go all the time. And it's the personal connections that you have with that company. They're going to keep your business going. Most definitely. Right. But you need to, I think the, the, the you know, the, the, the message there though is, but you got to work the list. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to be verifying it and you got to do email marketing and you know, you got to answer your phone. I mean, we get that from a lot of people. Our some of our competitors have an automated call system, which we do too. But we nine times out of ten, somebody will pick the phone up. We get back to our customers as fast as we can with voicemails and that type of thing. So yeah, I mean, it comes back to personalized customer service. Well, it's great. You know, it's it's funny because over the years I've spoken in front of like many like Vistage groups and other roundtable mm -hmm. type groups. And I said, you know, who here has great customer service? Everybody raises their hand. And I said, have you ever dialed your own 800 number? Exactly. And they, and everyone's looking at their shoes at that point, right? Because I said, on it, I could, I wouldn't embarrass anybody, but if I were to just mm -hmm. randomly pick one of you to call right now an 800 number, you would see an experience that nobody would, as human beings, we don't like that when we have to call American exactly. Express or, or our exactly. bank or anything like that. So why would your customers who have options right? Like exactly. you know, in most of these categories, there are options. Why would they tolerate that? So it's such an, and it's a, it's a relatively easy fix once you identify it. Yeah. You just always have to be thinking like your customer, putting yourself in your customer's shoes. It's the best way to sum up a lot of things. 
Isn't that true? That I Isn't love it? that. No, yeah. no, I love it. Yeah, think think like your customer. It's like, what exactly. would you like if you were your customer? Would you like to do deal? Would you like to do business with you? Exactly. I put myself in that kind of situation all the time when we have something coming up in the office or with a project or something. And I'm like, wait a second, let's look at it from the customer's point of view. Mm -hmm. And then everybody starts thinking and we're like, okay, this is what we have to do. It's all about integrity. Right. Well, you know, so, so the, the, the other part of that, right. So there's one and how you communicate that, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you know, things like you see, so you mentioned integrity. I don't want to skip over that. That's corporate culture. That's telling exactly. the truth. Um, well, and, yeah, I'm not talking like anything bad, but I'm just saying, you know, oh, they'll be okay with this dead, you know, deadline extending or this or that. And I'm like, no, we need to, to be on the level here and say it, we're not going to make the mark. You know, we messed up, whatever the matter is at hand. Yeah. And you know what, I, what I've told owners that I've, that I, uh, you know, again, doing strategic uh, planning with them, I said, first of all, anyone who buys in a category for any period of time uh, doesn't expect literal perfection because they, they know it's not possible. Everybody Correct. has makes mistakes. Correct. What they're looking for is who tells them they made a mistake and then fixes it. Exactly. Versus the person who's like, like the little kid putting the, uh, the broken vase under the carpet, you know, so mom may not notice it. You can't yeah, do that. Exactly. But businesses do that. And it's crazy. It's like, no, you yeah. gotta tell people the truth. Right. I think you're, I, I just learned at a young age, you're better off to just, you don't have to remember everything then. If you always tell the truth, then <laughs> you're good to go. <laughs> that's, that's very good. That's true. Otherwise it's a long, it's a long list of things. Exactly. You and it just keeps growing. <laughs> wow. So, well, so, so, all right. So, so now, you know, here we are, um, you know, 2022 coming off of like, you know, really a global event, right. Mm -hmm. That's still affecting some parts of the world still very roughly. Yes. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty as we, as we're speaking. I mean, who knows when somebody listens to this episode, it could be months from now, but exactly. as we're speaking, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, energy and fo even food and things, you know, know. all kinds of things. Right. So it's kind of crazy. Yep. So as a CEO leader of a company, you have to make decisions. Like you have to make strategic decisions. Like, are you investing in a new whatever machine? Are you investing in new hires? Are, you know, things that you have to decide about, which is the essence of strategy is making decisions with mm -hmm. what you're going to, you know, what people you're going to uh, need, what processes you're going to implement, what resources are you going to deploy? Um, so I guess my question is, as you look out at the future, how do you get your head wrapped around even trying to make those kind of decisions and planning? I mean, how do you do that in, in a world of such immense uncertainty that we're living in right now? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting that you should bring that up because um, through the pandemic and everything, I have, I'm noted as saying I have never pivoted so much in my life. Um, and it, it's, it, we were on a roll at one point, it was just decision after decision after decision, and it's physically exhausting. Some of those days I could just like, whoa, but I try, I try to keep my perspective and say, you know, it's baby steps. It's one step at a time. Okay. We have this huge problem. Let's begin. What's the first thing that needs to be taken care of. And I have to look at it. It's about perspective. It's just the way you look at things and how you ease into it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going for that main goal, that big mountain I got to get over but I know that I have to take steps to get there. So it's, I break the decisions down and it makes it a little bit easier. I'm not saying that decision-making is, is easy. I've overcome that whole thing because there still, I have days that are, it's very exhausting, but I, that's the best advice I could say about that is what I've learned. And I would have to say the pandemic would be the biggest challenge I've ever faced in business. I, I'm sure that there are many people that could say that. You just well, it was a real crucible for for a lot of people. Yeah. Some people didn't make it through. Yeah. Um, exactly. You know, and there's a lot of uh, I'm sure people think they, they were maybe missed opportunities or things they thought were going to go a certain way. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember the first days, I guess March was when it was real when we when yeah. they, the borders were closed to Europe. 
uh, March mm-hmm. of 2020. And, and that's yeah. when I realized, okay, this is not, this is like real. Like it, up till then, it was like background noise to me. I was going around my life. Yeah. And I it's had, the media and, yeah, you know, and all that. All that, right. And I, I had clients that were taking, it, you know, precautions and they said, okay, we're going to do some things around, you know, like cleanliness and you put signs yeah. up and stuff. But then that, that announcement, I think it was a Wednesday. Um, it was a Wednesday night. I think it was a press uh, president was speaking and he says, you know, we're closing up to Europe. And I said, Oh my goodness, this is real. And, but then there was a sense like, okay, this will be a couple of months. Yeah, and will be exactly. <laughs> and all these tight supply chains that people kept pushing stuff off their balance sheet from an inventory buffer point of view to earlier into the supply, you know, but it keeps going down to somebody exactly doesn't have a screw. And then uh, get- that would be us. There are <laughs> several instances where I have, we had the whole production of a major, uh, product and order was sitting there waiting for the dye that makes the resin black um the socketed head cap screws that holds the you know 120 inch chuck together so somebody can get their grinder going i mean just all those little parts that you know it there's lots of challenges right now a skilled labor making sure you mm-hmm. have enough people everything but yeah, nothing hurts more than uh, getting to the end of a project and realizing there's one little detail that you thought you had and you didn't or didn't have enough or whatever, or you thought you, we've always gotten them from the local Fastenal or, and I'm right. not naming that company at a dig at them. They're just down the street though. And they don't have any socketed hip cap screws. So then do you buy longer ones and cut them off? What, you know, what? <laughs> what is the plan here? Because we can't get it here fast enough. So wow, that, that, that was a major hurdle. Was and so that's, that's a lot of little pivots every day. Like yeah, what's, what's exactly. the pivot for today? What are we, yeah. what are we pivoting yeah, on today? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, you know, it sounds like also one thing I've heard, and, and, and I like your reflection on this, Sue, is that, you know, these kinds of experiences uh, coming through it have also made a lot of organizations um, kind of tighter exactly. uh, your work because you learned about working together maybe at a level of collaboration that you didn't have to before because you never yeah. worried about these things 100 been- yeah i totally agree with that uh you come out on the other side and you're you look back and you think look at what we did and we did it as a team so wow. it, it's a great experience Wow. Well, you know, one thing in, in uh, looking at your background, so you, you had an article post and it really resonated with me um, when you reflected on your father. Yes. And uh, my dad has been gone 25 years now. Right. Oh, so, wow. Uh, so, yeah. So he's, uh, but I, there's not a day, you know, where I don't think about him because exactly. he, had a, he had a great influence on me. So it sounds like a lot of these maybe approaches, uh, mindset, cultural things were mm-hmm. also things that kind of that you you attributed to your dad's example. Exactly. My parents had a huge play in who I am today. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was my a, mentor all the way until his last breath. So. Wow. That's that's really sweet. And that's, a, yeah. that's a, something, you know, so those are like legacy things, right? So sometimes... Mm-hmm people who are not in business think, and, and I know, and there's, there's a side of business that's like, let's say the PE investors that it's just, you know, it's just a thing you buy and you make mm-hmm. money with and so on. But I know for owner operators, business is a lot more than just an asset. Exactly. It's, it's, it's more. So could you just reflect a little bit on like, you know, what, what does it mean to run a business for you? Oh boy. <laughs> um, well, it's, you know, the days that I get up and I don't feel like working, I still come into work. Um, I think it's it's part personality traits, um, but it's also just I'm dedicated to it. It's not just a job for me, um, but I have a tendency to be that way no matter where I've worked in my past. Um, I just took it seriously, and that's probably my parents coming through to me as my work ethic. Um, I, I stick with things. I'm persistent we're going to, we're going to reach the goal some way or another. Now, does that, is that a healthy mindset? I'm not quite sure because there was a lot of sleepless nights, <laughs> especially during the pandemic and, and such, but um, it's, it's, 
it's invigorating. I love my job. I like to come to work. Um, I, I like the challenges that I face each day for the most part. I mean, like I said, there are some days that I'm completely exhausted from the decision making and did I do the right thing type thing, but um, I like it. It's not for everybody though. I, you know, definitely isn't. There's no correct. doubt. Right. There's, yep. there's no doubt. Not everybody can either start a business, run a business, take the responsibility. Or of, they, yeah, they just don't want that commitment. Right. And I understand that. I mean, I, that could be some of my employees mm -hmm. and I understand that. So we work together and, and we both get the job done side by side. So that's great. Great. Yeah. So I really appreciate you stopping by and, and well, sharing thank you some for of your having insights. Me. Oh, no, this is great. So if somebody listening wanted to know more about your firm, you where, where should they go on the web to learn more about you and, and maybe you in particular? Our website um, is obsidianmfg.com. We also have websites for our brands just because they were well-established names in the markets. And um, it'd be a little difficult to join them all into one website, but you can go to our main website and get to any of those. Um, okay. And I'm on LinkedIn. I mean, I'm open to connect with people. So just under my name, Sue Nordman. So fantastic. Sue, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank Business you again for purpose. having me. Absolutely. Our pleasure. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.